get started. Sounds good. Okay, so we want to take a moment to welcome everybody to this week's Family Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, today is September 22nd. And for those of you interested in your CME credit, you will want to make note and register before midnight tonight. But the event code today is 265047. So please make note of that. And I will also put the information in the chat box again here. Um, next slide. So as we get started here, if everybody could take a minute to just make sure that your microphone is muted, um, if you will remain attentive to the session, but also engaged. I know there's going to be some interaction in this session, so please feel free to interact. And then also at the end of the session, um, I'm going to be putting the evaluation link. If you can help us out and give our feedback to our presenter, we'd really appreciate that. Next slide. So this is the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds. We are partnered with the South um, Central AHEC and our department's mission statement is there for you. So CME transcripts, um, you are able to view your transcripts and see which sessions you have um, claimed. You, if you have any questions, you can certainly feel free to email me or you can contact the CME website, but do you, you will need that transcript. I'll, we'll go to the next slide here. Um, we offer AAFP credit for this session as well. So if you are wanting to claim AAFP credit, you'll need that CME transcript um, to claim credit. So if you do have any questions or issues, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, next slide. This slide here just wants to make sure that we point out to you that it is our goal um, as part of these sessions to make sure that we are following the um, nationally established physician core competency. So you can see those listed there. Um, next slide. Dr. Aldridge has no financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. And she is going to presenting, uh, be presenting a poem for us today. It's on primary medical care, continuity, and patient mortality. So I will let her go ahead and start. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so I will be presenting on this topic, primary care, um, continuity and patient mortality. And so I actually really liked that this topic was assigned to me because I think a lot of the time um, when we hear why people are passionate about family medicine, why they got into family medicine is because of that opportunity to have that continuity with our patients. And so I'm excited to kind of delve into this topic with you all today. All right, so um, just to kind of outline what we're going to be discussing, um, I am mostly discussing um, a review that was done, a literature review that was done um, that found the, the correlation between um, primary care continuity and patient mortality. And so with this presentation, we're going to further define the strength of that relationship between continuity of care and mortality rates and identify potential causative mechanisms, like what influenced that relationship, and also to promote further investigation of these causative mechanisms and um, further investigation of which patients would benefit most from continuity of care. So before we get started, I am going to ask for audience participation. You can do it through the chat, or if you are ever so bold, you can do it verbally. But I just wanted to see if anyone had any examples in which continuity of care either helped or um, the lack thereof hurt your patient? Any, any examples or experiences? I will give y'all 10 seconds <laughs> to have <laughs> a response. So I will speak, was someone else talking? Oh, I, I had a response. Oh, wonderful, thank you. I say with our clinic in particular, because we don't really have much continuity of care, it's actually really nice when we do have that continuity because then we kind of just pick up where we left off, time management wise, our medical management wise, versus when we are reading up almost like a new patient visit each time because we don't know them. We're time consuming, we miss things, we kind of have to see what was the other provider's mindset when we're trying to figure out where they were going with their diagnosis. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I agree. Anyone else? 
Well, I was going to give an example of, um, I think our clinic is a great example to see kind of both cases when we have to, like um, Dr. Serrano said, like start over with a patient. Um, and I was lucky enough to have gotten a continuity patient. Many of us have one or two or even three or four that we started with our intern year. And one of mine, I remembered it was helpful that I saw her each time because I kind of knew it was always going to be a battling conversation to discuss the control of her blood pressure. And so we didn't kind of have to go over uh, which antihypertensive she had tried before and failed before, or didn't like the symptoms one gave her. So it was helpful that she didn't have to go through that each time and we could kind of just pick up where we left off. So that's an example of how it can be beneficial. Another question I wanted to ask before we delve into it, because I kind of buried the lead a little bit, what would y'all guess is the relationship between continuity and mortality? Do you think more continuity raises a patient's risk of mortality or do you think it lowers the risk of mortality? If you have to take a wild guess. Lower. You would be correct, Dr. She. Thank you so much. It does lower the mortality rates. So with that, let's go into our next slide. Um, so the methods that this particular study used was that they selected studies from um, a database which um, had patients that saw were seen in um, mostly in primary care. So primary care meaning family medicine, internal medicine, um, not a specialist like a subspecialty like cardiology or rheumatology. And so um, the criteria for the studies they looked at is that they had to have a quantifiable measure of continuity. So a lot of them used um, number of visits with a primary care doctor. Um, to say that that was um, a, a, a evidence of continuity. Um, I know in some of these other studies, they use um, like months of time that they were seen, like so the frequency in which they were seen. So some sort of quantifiable measure of continuity. Um, they also had to uh, establish that continuity was based on the number of contacts with that same PCP um, in these studies and um, to have the assumption of a relationship continuity, meaning they had that same physician-patient relationship that was continuing. Um, and the studies had to have a quantifiable measure of mortality, um, which I guess is, is pretty straightforward to be dead or not. And so that, that was just the criteria for the studies that were included. And so um, to give you the results of the specific study populations and data, um, four studies included only older people. And as you might guess, or you may not, um, older people tend to have more um, continuity because they have more chronic conditions that need more frequent follow-up. Um, one study was restricted only to diabetic patients, which again is a chronic issue, needs more frequent follow-up. So it makes sense that um, that was something that they saw come up in the types of studies and the types of populations that these studies looked at. Some studies selected patients with um, like I said, specific chronic conditions. So chronic conditions, diabetes, CKD, um, hypertension is associated with older people. We're seeing a trend here. Um, one selected population was only military veterans. So uh, with our residency, we have a unique opportunity to kind of see both the uh, I guess, regular, non, I guess you would call it civilian, older patient population, but we also rotate through the VA and get to see the military veteran population, which tends to be older individuals, although they can be younger. Um, data in the studies was from a few weeks to 17 years. So we have like a wide breadth of data in, in terms of what they followed up and the mortality that they looked at. And the continuity data were collected to a cutoff point in some studies while others collected continuity data up to the time of death. So some that were perhaps only for a few weeks only looked at um, how the continuity and mortality related over the course of let's say like three months. Others looked at it until that patient that they were following that cohort and the patients within that cohort died. And so um, just to give you an idea, because they looked at several studies, this is just what uh, generally they saw coming from the study. So it's based on the population we would expect to have more associated with um, continuity. So the relationship, we've already established that it lowered, that the continuity of care um, lowers the mortality rates, but I guess let's see what the results actually show. So nine out of 12 of the studies um, found a statistically significant protective effect of greater continuity on all cause mortality. So for any cause of mortality, it seemed like in nine of these studies, statistically significant protective, meaning that the more continuity they had, the lower their all-cause mortality was. 
that that was the result that came from this. And two of the studies, the entire um, of the entire primary care population, one of them found a protective association specifically for coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease mortality rates, and one found a protective association for cancer and COPD. So um, that was like the specific foci of those studies. Um, but as you can see, it it kind of relates to that chronic illness. So um, I got those numbers from this aspect of the Baker et al. Uh, study that I'm examining in this um, presentation. So you can see all the way up here, I don't know if you can see it, I can see it, but it says it started with 1,613 studies. And so based on all of those exclusion criteria I mentioned, um, excluding duplicates, uh, making sure that they have a, um, a quantitative uh, measure of continuity and of mortality, um, we deduced that this was the number of uh, studies that were included in a qualitative uh, synthesis. So it was 13, and like I mentioned in a previous slide, of those 13, nine found a statistically significant protective effect of greater continuity. Um, two did not find a significantly uh, statistically significantly effect and one studied um, varied. It depended on how they measure continuity. Um, and so I guess the general takeaway is that this is very well founded to claim that uh, continuity of care kind of helps to decrease mortality. And so that's something that um, is important for us as primary care physicians to know that what most of us have endorsed as some, a reason why we got into family medicine is effective in the main outcome of life or death. You know, a lot of studies look at, you know, outcomes of morbidity and like, um, you know, well, well controlled um, chronic conditions are not well controlled, but the ultimate outcome that all physicians are trying to, I guess, help prevent in a way as much as we can is um, death, especially like preventative death. And so uh, we have a very key role based on these stats and that and doing that for our patients. So the other thing that this study looked at that I wanted to point out is the potential causal mechanisms, meaning, okay, we know that the cause, uh, we know that the um, effect of having more uh, continuity is lower mortality, but what causes this effect? What, it, what are the uh, mechanisms by which this effect comes? So what they found is contributing variables that were not directly studied, but they figured, you know, this is a common trend we're seeing qualitatively is that the, the greater the physician had a knowledge of the patient that helped with the uh, lowering the mortality. So in the case of like my patient with the high blood pressure, um, I kind of knew where she lived. I kind of knew what what she, her mindset towards these antihypertensives. And so um, that kind of helped prevent the struggle because if you spend five out of your 15 minute visit trying to establish a history and establish a rapport with the patient, you may not actually get anything done. But if you know this patient, they know that you have their best um, well-being in, uh, like in, in mind, then they will probably trust you more to make some of those changes, which she eventually did. And that kind of segues to the second point, there was increased patient trust when they saw the same provider um, periodically, and that improved their adherence to the medical advice. So this patient knew I had her best interest in mind. So she was like, okay, fine, go ahead and increase my blood pressure medication um, because there was that rapport there. And um, another contributing variable was enhanced clinical responsibility when the same physician offers care. So do I feel responsible for this patient? Yes, to this day, I still make sure um, that, you know, she usually has follow up with me, but if she doesn't, I do, she will end up, especially now that we have um, messaging and things like that, um, even before with Sunrise, she would call to make sure that I knew that she was seen by someone else and this is what they decided to do, which I appreciated. Um, and so, Another kind of off topic point with this patient, she did develop cancer. And so um, of course I sent her to oncology to kind of further work that up, but I felt responsible to make sure I knew what her chemo schedule was to make sure I knew when her last, when her next visits were and those types of things. So we discussed that in our visit as well, because you do feel like a responsibility for this patient when they come to you primarily for most of their care. Um, and that also has to do with the, um, clinical system, which we'll get into more, but like, you know, using things like Epic to stay in constant communication with the patient, using things like care everywhere to see what's going on with their care elsewhere, um, I think is something that they also agree contributes to the lower mortality. Um, some of the confounding variables uh, that will 
kind of confound the, that, we, that the continuity of care is what led to the actual lowering of mortality is that sometimes a very, very ill patient would just choose the most readily available provider. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that choosing, you know, they'll just take who they can get basically. And so they may not have continuity if they're very, very ill. And so that may or may not affect that kind of con con continuum, that relationship. Another confounding variable they saw was like having higher mortality was associated with a higher concentration of more serious illness. So maybe a person can have cancer, but what if they also have CKD? What if they also have um, liver disease? So having more of serious illnesses the continuity of it may not be enough of a protective effect against mortality. I will pause there because I said a mouthful. Is there any questions by any chance so far? In the chat, I don't see anything except for that Dr. Nato was correct that it does lower mortality. Jasmine. Seeing this, this is, oh, yes. Sorry, this is Yun. I, you might have said it, I might have been missed it while driving. So how did they determine or define continuity in the studies? So it was kind of a variety because th thanks for your question, Dr. She That's a very good question, but they looked at several studies. And so um, the different methodology was, uh, I, don't, I, ha I don't have the specifics, but sometimes it was based on like the number of contacts they had with the primary care physician. So like say, what the same physician saw the same patient three times, then that would be like the measure of continuity. And in some cases it was based on um, the continuum. Like if it was like seen eight months from now by the same provider or the same clinic. So it wasn't very like, because it wasn't just like one randomized observe or quasi experimental trial. Um, I didn't have like a very specific measure, but that was the idea. Of, that's the approach that they took. But thank you for asking the question. I want to move on to um, some other commentary. Suggested patient factors supplied by relational continuity. So these are the things that the patient provides, because in the other slide here, we kind of talk about um, like the influence of the physicians, like their clinical responsibility, their knowledge. But what um, what, what's good for the patient uh, in this continuity relationship is that they do have that trust and good communication. Like I said, they don't have to repeat their story. They feel more safe and it, it helps facilitate the ease of navigating a complicated healthcare system. And so those are things that we, you know, want to consider from the patient's perspective why they, besides like lowering their risk of mortality, it also helps with these things to trust, not having to repeat the story. We have all had patients who were exasperated by the fact that, you know, if, if one of us got pulled to the hospital and another one of us had to cover for the clinic, they would be like, well, I wanna see my other doctor because they know the whole story about like my migraines or the whole story about my um, amputated leg and dealing with the prosthetics companies. So um, to have that same continuity really helps the patients in a lot of like psychological ways. All right, so um, we'll discuss some of the study's limitations. Um, and see, okay, yeah, this is a good point. They did not assess informational continuity, meaning the access to information um, to the patient. So like our patients have the, I guess my chart that gives them access to their uh, records, access to be able to communicate with us. So these didn't necessarily look at whether or not they were following up with those communication portals. Um, it really only looked at the office visits themselves. Similarly, um, they didn't assess management uh, continuity, like the coordination of care, meaning, you know, sometimes our MAs and LVNs will call to help coordinate DME and uh, referrals and those types of things. So that is also continuity of care, but more in an information or man management role versus the relational role with the physician. Um, it was also possible that they could have had multiple contacts with a provider because that provider was available and not necessarily the fact that they had a relationship with the provider. So that's something we have to always point out. It may not have been their choice and they may not have had such a loving relationship with the provider as I do with my patients. Some patients I just happen to see frequently because I am in clinic that month and if they need to be seen twice, they'll see me again. And so um, we don't want to overlook the fact that that could have been the case and maybe it's not so much like the trust in the building 
something. Maybe it's just a matter of convenience. And lastly, um, generalizing that all patient populations with all morbidities will have improved mortality with continuity um, when there are very specific study populations in the study. So going back to the populations that were studied, most of them were older patients, diabetic patients, they had chronic diseases, military veterans, so again, older patients. And so that may not extrapolate to um, a 40-year-old with a chronic disease and may not extrapolate to you know, pediatrics who have pediatric uh, patients who have chronic diseases. So that is a limitation to admit that we can't necessarily say, oh yes, everyone should have continuity of care. My bias is that's true, but um, we don't have, I guess, data to back that up necessarily. So that's something that we should be aware of in looking at the study. So here's the part that I got really excited about is if we know that uh, primary care continuity can help to lower mortality in these patients, in this specific patient population, older adults with chronic uh, morbidities um, and some of the military veterans that we see in the VA, that means that's a population that we are currently treating. So how can we, you know, um, ensure that this continuity happens to get that benefit? So wait, did I skip? Them? No. Okay. So promoting better continuity, why should we do it? Well, it benefits the patient because it reduces all-cause mortality, improves adherence for all of the other reasons we just discussed. It improves, um, it benefits the physician by allowing us to cultivate greater knowledge of that patient. And I didn't write it here, but it also helps you cultivate greater knowledge of their disease process. In the case of my high blood pressure patient, it was a lot of her um, chronic kidney disease that was playing into it. And so I was very closely following her, her nephrology notes as well. Um, and also for the physician, it helps in enhancing that sense of responsibility for that patient. Um, and it can potentially help with clinic workflow. I feel that, um, Whenever you have a regular patient that is seen by uh, the same PCP or provider and the same like set of MAs and LVNs, they kind of get to know uh, the patients very well. They, they, and the, the patient also gets to know their names very well. Like they know I'm Dr. Aldrich. My name is listed all over their prescription bottles all over their um, ABS. And it might be helpful if each time the phone was answered, they know that it's the MA or the LVN who usually works with Dr. Aldridge. And so I think that if that were something we could like coordinate here, I'm not sure how feasible it is, but that would also benefit the workflow because everyone would just kind of get in the system. So I, that's why I put that, like we can have a shift in perspective on the importance of having policies that support this continuity, meaning if we had the infrastructure here to be able to associate one LVN, one MA with one PCP, which I know sounds like ideal and would probably take a lot more people <laughs> um, than what we have money for, but that could really create this sense of like, you know, if someone calls Jen, they know they're going to get Dr. Aldridge. Right now, if they call Jen, they might be asking for anyone in the clinic. And that's fine. We have made it work, but I'm just speaking from a future directions perspective, when you think about going to work in other outpatient areas and those types of things, think about these system, systemic effects that could um, um, benefit the patient all based on the findings of continuity lowering mortality. Um, so for future research, I would consider that specific patient factors and situations and continuity um, yield an advantage. So really assessing out like of the chronic conditions, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, um, liver disease, cancer, maybe trying to figure out which ones do the best in pri primary continuity. Because the other thing that's interesting with those chronic conditions is that is that odds are they will have a secondary uh, specialist who is also taking care of their care. And so that would be kind of interesting to see which um, an, within the realm of the chronic conditions, the primary care has the most benefit for. Um, also future research uh, directions could be how to achieve continuity and a complexity of primary care, meaning our, you know, we're always across the nation. <laughs> Every PCP is always booked. You may not see the same one because of like the booking and like the scheduling and all of that. Um, so within this complex world of healthcare, specifically primary care that we live, how could we help to facilitate continuity a little bit better? Um, and how to advocate for these policies to be put in place. So um, I think I've mentioned to everyone by now that <laughs> Dr. Garcia and myself got a chance to do um, the advocacy conference back in May of this year through the TMA, where we got to advocate on behalf of the TMA um, different policies or uh, 
um, concepts that they were like lobbying for Congress to consider. Um, one of them was like continuing telemedicine um, despite the emergency use, like whenever the pandemic is over, we still need this to be something that we can use and get um, reimbursed for in our clinics. That's something that, you know, we advocated for. And so those are the ways that you can kind of really facilitate change, even in like our own resident um, clinic, because these these policies, we deal with Medicare and Medicaid, just like the clinics outside of an academic institution. And so whatever Congress decides is like a law passable bill or whatever, um, that affects how we are able to um, practice. And so advocating for policies that would support continuity, such as like having more MAs and maybe, you know, giving MAs better pay. Like, I don't know. I just like, touch the tip of the iceberg with this policy information. It's really interesting, but those are ways that we can help facilitate the uh, continuity change, which is the takeaway from this uh, paper. So I have a call to action for you guys. I think that those were like lofty ideals to do the future research. And you know, it takes time to get all of those together, get the IRB and all of that. So what can we do now as residents, as attendings, as anyone else who is on this call? Um, we can identify what barriers there are to continuity. I know I said sometimes when we have inpatient schedules, not just our inpatient um, service, but also when we're off service, working like on inpatient peds or um, NICU or things like that, we're only available one half day a week. So that prevents our ability to like follow up with patients. Um, you know, say one month I'm on an outpatient rotation. I'm like, yeah, see me in six weeks. Well, in six weeks, you're going to be very limited to just, you know, four, even limited, like two, four or six patients, because <laughs> it's going to be a limited patient panel. Um, and we have those limitations for a reason. You know, we don't have the capacity to see all these patients in just such a limited period of time. So those are the things that can put up a barrier to continuity. Um, so those are just two that I thought of. If y'all think of other ones, I think that would be helpful for, there's always been QI projects kind of to try to assess the like bottleneck in clinic, what helps clinic not flow as well and those types of things. So this would be another um, QI or extension of a current QI project that I would start thinking that I would encourage you all to think about. Um, Number two, we can gather a multidisciplinary perspective of what is causing the issue because we residents know very well what we think you know our barriers are, but maybe we don't know from the perspective of the attendings, the MAs, the schedulers. Um, and I know there's been just continued discussions of this, but I'm bringing it up again because we see that these are the things that can um, help or hinder continuity. And we know that continuity is something that lowers mortality. So um, again, just ways to think about uh, addressing those deficits. And generally, my call to action is for us to change our clinic culture uh, with managing patients' expectations. I know, especially of late, having nine on the schedule and more, more often than not seeing like six of the nine on average, you really have to let them know, like, I only have so much time to discuss this, but you know what? I can bring you back. You know what? There might be another um, position you'll see, but I'll be sure to communicate with them. Like, I always kind of give my patients expectations. Like, if I know I'm about to go into an inpatient or off-service rotation, I may not be the one to see them back in four to six weeks. So I'll let them know that it'll be one of my colleagues, but please trust and believe they are reading my note. They know what we've discussed today. So be reassured. So I try to give them like a heads up about it. Um, and then we have to, uh, you know, be realistic about what the clinic can handle and accommodating all of these patients. And again, that kind of goes with just letting them know, like I might have to bring you back multiple times to address multiple different things just because of like um, our limited time together. Um, but yeah, in general, this whole slide is just a call to action to think about what other ways we can provide continuity in the context of our overall system, um, not just with our residents and attending seeing patients, but with the LBNs and MAs reaching out to the patients, following up on their results if everything's normal, those types of things. So um, before I summarize the major points, there was a couple of uh, PDFs that I did want to point out. So I'm gonna switch to sharing those. Um, because I think they might be helpful in pointing out some of the things I've outlined here today. So let me just use my tech savviness real quick and switch over to the PDF before I summarize. Um, I really liked, not that, I didn't like that. There is there was a diagram I really liked that I wanted to show you all. Let me make sure. I had it queued up, but technology doesn't always cooperate with you guys or with me. Um, 
here it is. Okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger, but this might be it. Watch, I make it like too big. So I hope you all can see that. Let me know in the chat if you can. But this is a diagram from, um, it was another kind of literature review of continuity of care and chronic diseases done in 2017. Yeah. Um, it shows like what are the antecedents to um, needing to have continuity of care. So one antecedent is having a chronic disease. And if the patient has um, an experience with their disease management, and if there's a poorly coordinated healthcare system and limitation in medical care, those are like a recipe for, I don't want to say disaster, but for lack of a better term, a recipe, the recipe for disaster, right? So that's like the antecedent. And then if you have care over time, a relationship between the individual patient and the care team, information transfer, that's what we were talking about with the informational continuity with the my chart or something like a my chart and um, coordination of care a little bit better. What you yield is having decreased hospital admissions, deducing costs and overall healthcare costs, um, dedu deduction in emergency department visits and improved quality of life and improved patient satisfaction and overall delivering good health. So I just thought this diagram was perfect um, because it really shows what happens like besides decreasing mortality, you end up having all these other effects when you have care over time in a relationship with your chronic disease patients. Um, and that's something that we also talked about at that advocacy summit, um, you know, trying to promote primary care so that people don't use the emergency department as a uh, like primary care visit. Um, because that costs a lot, if not for the patient, for the county, or uh, I honestly don't know how it all works, but I know it costs a lot and someone has to pay it. Maybe it's our tax dollars. I don't know. I'm a little ignorant about it, but I'm learning more. Um, and so that that is something that we're helping to reduce. And it improves the quality of life of a patient because if any of us had to go wait for 12 hours at university hospital, I can guarantee you we would say that is not contributing to our quality of life. And that's what many of our patients end up doing. We've all been in the ED at 2 a.m. when we're admitting a patient and they've been there for 13, 16 hours just because there are so many patients for them to get through. And the ED has to make a decision between triaging the most complicated or the most the most um, critical patients. And so if you have, um, you know, like, you experienced a fall or something like that, you may have to continue to wait until um, they're able to see you. And so quality of life gets, you know, increased when they don't have to keep going to the emergency room for something like a UTI that we could probably counsel them about here. Um, and the other paragraph I wanted to share before I conclude was in this page. This is by, this is by, um, it was an, a, a study looking at continuity of care with primary care physician and mortality in older adults. It was done in 2009, a little bit older, but I really liked the sentence. <laughs> so I wanted to share it with you guys because I just want to reiterate in different ways um, the same points. I'm trying to make it bigger. I'll read it out for you guys. It says that the uh, largest variations indicate that Having continuity was more often likely amongst those with lower subjective life expectancy, they were high school graduates, those with fair or poor self-rated health, people who had difficulty walking, higher levels of depressive symptoms, having arthritis, cancer, diabetes, lung disease, heart conditions, hypertension, stroke, psychological conditions, as well as those hospitalized within the year prior to baseline. Um, and nearly every within role comparison, the highest percentages of these characteristics was found for those having continuity all the time, suggesting that one reason older adults have continuity is to deal with their increased health burdens. So this sentence to me represents our population and why they need to have regular continuity of care. Um, a lot of them have arthritis. Like I know I've been harping on um, CKD and liver disease and diabetes because they were on my mind, but the other things that we have to remember is like our patients that we see with psychological conditions like bipolar patients or um, our generalized anxiety patients, our uh, major depressive patients, like they also need to be seen regularly. A lot of us have a lot of older adults who have uh, gait instability and often need to be seen for um, reevaluation of why they might need certain DME. 
um, like a wheelchair or rolling walker and those types of things. Um, and so I just thought this really highlighted our patient population really well and is another testament to why uh, continuity of care um, is definitely needed and definitely uh, relevant to us. So going back to my summary, um, greater continuity of care confers a protective effect on all cause mortality rates. The mechanism contributing to this association is greater knowledge of the patient on behalf of the physician, um, increased patient trust, meaning the patient trusts us more, and enhanced clinical responsibility. I wanted that to kind of apply to the entire team, um, the MAs, the LVNs, the attendings, the residents, our supportive staff, everyone has a greater responsibility when they know this patient, like, because they know this patient called about this, and this is the patient that I just saw type thing. And lastly, that older, um, the older population of adults seem to benefit the most from the continuity of care. Um, and that really was driven home by the sentence I just read about all the things that um, the chronic conditions and also like gait instability and those types of things that they have. I usually talk fast. Um, and so maybe I finished a little bit sooner than I wanted, but I am more than happy to take everyone's questions now. Well, people are thinking questions. I just want to make a, a couple of comments, and that is, um, it's a complex topic, and so I appreciate your uh, your tackling it. It's really important. I don't think we need to wait till we've got perfect solutions to start any solutions because continuity is good. So even a little continuity is better than no continuity, right? So things that you can do um, to help with that are definitely worth um, the effort and. Um, and better for the better for the patient. So I appreciate that you're uh, you're bringing the topic up. I, I think you know part of the nature of the training is um, you've got all the rotate these rotations to do. You know our graduates go and a lot of them take uh, take up practices where they're seeing nine and a half days a week, right? So it's easier for the patients to develop some continuity. And I think you can see in a setting like that um, how uh, that would have some advantages. So. Um, uh, just a few general comments about continuity. So thanks for that. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Nato. Yeah, one of, one of the things in the um, uh, literature that we were looking at for other stuff about continuity and morbidity mortality, um, there was a point made in one of the articles is that team continuity hasn't been um, really studied well. So does team continuity, which we have in our clinic, um, that's why we have our color teams. Does that improve um, outcomes? And so I don't know if um, anyone wants to be brave and um, give us an assessment of how they feel like our team continuity plays in the FHC and if they've seen that actually um, help with patient care or not. The Pursani is here. And for team continuity, when we have IDX, I was able to follow and we were able to provide 70%, 75% con team continuity for our patient. With the EPIC, I cannot follow that, but with the IDX, we were able to reach to that point. One of the things that I believe that we can do a little bit more, as Dr. Aldridge mentioned, just informing the patient that you are going to be seen by one of my team member. If we can bring that language in, I believe it's going to be very helpful. Yeah, and um, so I, I think that's a big thing. So, I mean, we, we do, it's a very complex system and we have a very complex patient population. So that's where the team continuity came out of. Um, another, there's a lot of, you know, literature, you know, improving access improves continuity, which makes logical sense. So then it goes back to in the complexities of the system, how do we um, improve access? And so that's um, something that Dr. Persani has looked at extensively um, and is worth continuing to look at. And then again, prior to prioritizing um, certain populations like Dr. Aldridge um, brought up, you know, so are, are there certain, you know, diabetics, we should, you know, make that much more of an effort to make sure that they continuously are seeing the same person. Um, and then also just looking at the whole healthcare team. And, you know, again, there's not 
great literature on that, but that's something that needs to be looked at. So in the complexities where physicians sometimes become managers um, and do the, the, the management continuity, which is the coordination of care, um, does it help to have continuity in um, you know, pharmacology and promotoras and nursing staff? And are there other ways to provide that continuity when the physician really just can't get to all of their continuity patients that also improves outcomes. So there's a lot of things in the future to look at many ways we've tried to come around it in the complexity of our systems, but I think it's um, an um, interesting concept to keep trying to work on since it's pretty clear and it's a no brainer, but they, they studied it to prove it that continuity does um, improve outcomes. And thank you, Dr. Lemers, for mentioning our like phonomotoras and the pharmacology team, because I definitely think that has been helpful for me personally. I get a lot of staff messages back and forth from um, Dr. Uh, Gonzalez Schinkler, and it really helps. She's really good about getting the information from the promotoras, seeing the physician who's going to see that patient next, and then emailing or staff messaging that physician to say, this is something that this patient was concerned about. They expressed it. Like I had a patient who had fallen recently and the promotora saw them, I think a day or two after. And so they were coming to me a day or two after that. And so um, it was good to have that they literally laid eyes on them, you know, and um, I think that was very helpful. So that is uh, something that would be good to kind of prove that I, my assumption is that it has been very helpful, especially in our population, but it would be nice to kind of prove that because I think when you prove things, you get more funding for things and like, that's the way the world goes around. Um, and the other thing I also wanted to say, uh, a question that I have for my attendings on board, how would y'all suggest we uh, go about the overbooking process? Because the only reason why I ask is because sometimes if we ask our MAs to schedule a patient with us and we really need to see them like in two or three weeks, they'll say like, oh, well, can I overbook you? And then I think my first year I was like, no, but now I'm like, I, yeah, I need to see him, you know? So I, I wondered how to approach that because I know that they would then have to call like Emily in order to override the things that they can't override. So is there any guidance for how y'all will want us to do that? Because I think a lot of us have been doing that to try to achieve more continuity. Hey, this is Palacios. So, uh, so yeah, just, you know, uh, remember we have, a high no-show rate ranges anywhere between 25% up to about 35% at any given time. So um, because of the high no-show rate, we do encourage everyone, especially if you're looking for short follow-up to overbook yourself. So if you want to overbook or fast track yourself, meaning you're overbooking them to follow up on a very specific issue, blood pressure, diabetes, what have you, just let your MA know, and they they know what to do after that. Um, Epic does make it a little difficult to sometimes accommodate some of these extra visits, but we do have workarounds in place for that. So just let your MA know, MA know and they should take it from there. I think for the residents, you know, where we've all been in a position where everybody shows up and it's you know scary, but um, but I think the preceptors try to work hard at um, you know, sort of leveling the load. I know when I'm looking at leveling, I try to ask the person if you know, there's any specific persons they wanna make sure that they see, you know, if it's somebody you've never seen before, probably moving a person is not as big an issue as if it's somebody you already overbooked because you wanted to see them, right? So uh, there's many factors at work, but we do try to, uh, we do try to work um, to uh, maintain some continuity, even, even in that, um, in that setting. Um, and then the other comment I want to make was, um, you know, medicine's very personal, right? People, um, get better within the context of their relationship with the system, with the people within the system, including us. And, um, so I, I don't, I think it'd be too strong to say that that matters to every patient, but I think it matters to a heck of a lot of patients. And, um, and so the uh, therapeutic part of your relationship is obviously enhanced by the continuity. And, um, you know, I think we all understand that, you know, being a good physician, a good family physician is more than just knowing the right antibiotic to choose, right? It's, it's uh, there's also some uh, relationship aspects of it uh, that help, you know, with the therapeutic relationship with the patient that ultimately can improve uh, health and health care for the patient. 
And interesting, there were some studies that suggest that if you don't have the knowledge um, that the patients will self-select not to have continuity <laughs> with you if they don't get what they need. So um, that, that I, I think it all comes together in one basket. Yeah, I think the patients have choice. And so sometimes we don't have continuity because they're searching around and sometimes that's okay. But, but I think often we can provide continuity and, and often that's better. Yeah, no, I appreciate y'all's comments. Um, residents, I hope you plug that in your ears in terms of um, the flexibility with being able to overbook ourselves and um, how that logistically works. And also knowing that our attendings do help to distribute if everyone happens to show up that day. I know my attending, Dr. Prasani, helped me out today. So they are always willing to help. I, I am a testament of it. <laughs> But um, yes, I uh, appreciate those comments from our faculty. Um, any questions or concerns from any of the residents or any other persons on the call? Hi, this is Yun here. I, I think Dr. Palacios had said every single resident should have a few spots on their panel to see their continuity patients. If you have not uh, feel like they are scheduled in that way, then please uh, let Dr. Palacios, maybe Dr. Persani know, and then we'll increase the continuity of care and also encourage everyone to claim yourself as their resident PCP. So that will help facilitate the process. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Ian, for mentioning that. You can, if anyone has a question of how, you can ask. I'm kind of a super user myself, um, and you can of course ask Dr. Palacios and any other attending how to um, make yourself the uh, team member of that particular patient. And also, um, what else was I gonna mention based on what she just said? Mm, I think, oh, 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 I was looking around at who's here. And I wanted to also give a shout out to the behavioral health consultants for their, their um, contribution to our continuity. I know I mentioned pharmacology to promotoras. And so I did want to also say BHC really helps um, with the continuity of our patients with psychological conditions. As one of our, the studies that I mentioned showed, um, that is a patient population that would need more frequent follow-up. And so it's very helpful when they're being seen by both because um, then it becomes like they might be seen by one or two BHCs. Usually it's the same one. And so I think that's helpful for them, um, but it, it, it helps that they see them so that we can see what they've talked about. And we may not have to fully address it in our visit because they have um, lightened that burden for that particular health issue. So I want to just mention that's also another great way that our clinic in particular helps with um, continuity. Hey, Jasmine, this is uh, Byron Hepburn. You know, I, I apologize, but I was, uh, my uh, Wi-Fi disconnected here over at the university, but, and I may have, this may have already come up, but you know, when you, a lot of you graduate, uh, you're going to be in practices where you're going to have a team of teams with uh, nurse practitioners and PAs. So you'll have a team continuity and it, it, it's really, it's very powerful. And I hope you do have behavioral health. Uh, many clinics, unfortunately, don't. But if you do, that's, that's very powerful, as well as pharmacy and the promotoras, certainly. Um, I think the other thing we ought to emphasize, too, is your professional satisfaction and, and worth is going to be enhanced when you have that continuity and you're hopefully you'll have some joy in your practice as opposed to just cranking through the numbers. And so uh, Dr. Nato appropriately talked about therapeutic alliance. You can't have a therapeutic alliance without that trust and continuity. So those are all powerful things. And then you talk about efficiency and effectiveness. Um, there's a dollar figure to this too. You do become more effective. And when they have that therapeutic alliance, you're not having to order as many tests or invasive procedures because you can make that rational choice and they do have confidence, your team and your counsel to them. So those are just a few of my thoughts about continuity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hepburn. I really appreciate uh, you mentioning that. I definitely agree that um, it, it, is, it does contribute to uh, professional satisfaction. Just having, seeing the progress of a patient that you've seen over the course of their illness, um, seeing them improve, I think is something we're able to see in the short period of time that we have in residency if we started with them in our first or early second year. So that is pretty satisfying. And so I do appreciate you mentioning that because um, it's, you know, it's something that I don't think was really emphasized in many of the articles actually. So that's a good point to kind of point out 
Um, and also just the fact that we are really spoiled here with all of our BHCs, our pharmacology. I, I, I'm, I'm, I am going to miss it if I don't have it where I go next. So um, it's definitely something that is good for us to take advantage of while we're here. Well, so thank you. On for a serious everything. note, and I don't want to emphasize it, but you know, um, you're going to also be taking, taking care of some very serious pathologies at end of life care. And to have that continuity is invaluable for that family um, to work them through uh, the, the dying process. So um, there's a serious note to it, as well as the positive of, thing, of patients improving, which we all hope for. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I've got a really good discussion going. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts or comments or want any other information from me? <laughs> Well, hearing none, I move to adjourn this meeting. Um, <laughs> do I have the power to do that? <laughs> yes, you do. Thank you so much, Dr. Aldridge. I did forget to mention that Dr. Weimers was your preceptor, if nobody guessed that. So thank you so much as well for her. And for everyone who joined and discussed today, we appreciate everybody here. So with that, we will adjourn. Thank y'all. Have a good one. Thank you, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. Bye.